Hi, I'm Joe Brand and I'm great company, apparently. When did you first realise that you were funny? Um, well, I thought I was funny as a child, but then I saw an interview. For some reason, they, they went to talk to my granddad about it. <laughs> And he said I was very grumpy and I had no idea. So, um, yeah, it's difficult to say. I think I was, I was the middle child of, and I had two brothers mm. and they were like complete kind of pranksters mm. and would would torment me, basically. Mm. And I think well, my favourite episode with them ever was where we lived in the middle of nowhere in Kent and we used to go and play in the woods all day like you were allowed to in those days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> And I remember once I trod in a wasp's nest and like this massive swarm of wasps sort of came out and my brothers ran one way and I ran the other and they chased my brothers and stung them really badly. I was so <laughs> delighted at the time. I was only seven. <laughs> but it's true. It's funny when you, uh, I think also growing up with brothers because I had sisters and I had a younger sister and I gave her a hard time. Did you? Uh, yeah, I did give her a hard time, but in a sort of loving way. And how do you give someone a hard time in a loving way? I don't know. I used to, <laughs> I used to do all sorts of things. Like she had a horse, and she had a horse. <laughs> when I played, yeah, I'm trying to make it relatable. She had a horse. She had a pony called Teasel. And every single time we had an argument, didn't matter where in the world it was, I would then go and pick up a stone and say, "This is going to kill Teasel," and throw it. <laughs> And she would hate it. But what it... I'm not surprised she would hate it. She would hate it. But I think when you have that sort of relationship, especially maybe with brothers, it 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 gives you... I, I, my sister definitely has this sort of... Um, I, I don't know what... The, this sort of inner confidence as well in a strange way. I don't know if your brothers gave you that. Because she sort of learned how to deal with it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I suppose you're just trying to make yourself look good there. But... Um... <laughs> I taught my sister inner strength. Oh, oh, well done. Um, no, I'm joking. Yeah, I suppose so. I kind of got... I mean, they were awful to me. Were they really? Sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I once was sat on a five-bar gate and um, my brother, my little brother Matt pushed it and, it and it swung shut and I fell off the back. And as I fell off, my arm got sort of ripped open on barbed wire. And what did my brothers do? pissed themselves laughing I had half my arm hanging out and I had to walk home on my own and then of course my mum and dad went, <laughs> and you know we went to a and &E and everything yeah but it, it was sort of it was kind of a bit like that really but were you were you because did you become a rebel were you a bit of a rebel event yes well I say eventually yes I was I mean I got chucked out of home when I was 16 what was that for um, well, well, for having a boyfriend who was a local drug dealer, and also my parents hate my my dad was like very left wing when he was younger, mm. and um, this boyfriend was extremely posh, and he he brought me home quite late one night, and of course my dad loved doing that kind of like old man brand thing where mm. he sort of said to me, "What do you mean by bringing my daughter home at this time and all this kind of thing?" And uh, this guy said to him. But my dear chap, right? Yeah. Which my dad, you know, hated that sort of thing and thought it was patronising. And he said, don't say anything like that to me again or I'm going to hit you. And so he went, but my dear chap, the fool. <laughs> so my dad hit him and knocked him out. Um, <laughs> and, okay. You know, he was, yeah, absolutely. What? And the, thing, and the thing with my dad, just to say, is that my dad suffered from quite severe depression and mm. I think that was the big part of his temper and his his violence. He was violent on occasions, so... Was he? He was, yeah. Towards yeah. towards you? Yeah. Joe. It's I, all right, Joe. It's all right, I'm over it. Are you sure? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you, I could, am. you could talk to me, we're here. We could talk to... Thanks. But that's... Because that's, I did... I, I, I heard... Well, I read... Um, that you, you, your father was undiagnosed and he, if I'm right in saying, he had depressive episodes and you said that though he would go through these episodes a lot and that must be tricky because as a kid, you don't really understand what's going on. No, you just think they're being horrible. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah, he was for a long time. He didn't, he wouldn't go and see anyone about it. My mum tried to persuade him for years and then eventually he did when he was in his mid fifties. And he was um, prescribed antidepressants and it absolutely changed his life and it changed him. 
Did it really? It really did, yeah. And I, as an ex-mental health nurse, I wouldn't say antidepressants are the answer to every type of depression, but certainly with him, it was, you know, life-changing, really. It was really interesting. Yeah, I, 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 someone said to me there are side effects to antidepressants, um, but the side effects to depression is suicide, so why wouldn't you give them a try? And yeah. I kind of really agree with that. And it, it, so it completely changed his life for the better. He became, he dealt with life much easier then. Yeah, and he was very different. He was like much more relaxed, more humorous. You know, it really, really made a huge difference to him. Yeah, yeah. But was that hard growing up? Yeah, it was very hard. It was very hard um, because because he was he had kind of odd, odd ideas as well. He was very strict about. Um, particularly me, because I was the only girl, you know, mm. about me going out, about me going out with blokes, about about all that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I don't really, I remember it, they let me have a 16th birthday party, and you can imagine what that was like. They said, we'll go out and we'll, we won't come home till midnight. And of course it all went like it does. Mm. And um, they came home an hour early and a friend of mine who was really pissed opened the door and threw up on my dad's feet. So that didn't bode well. And then he just kind of rampaged around the house, shouting and threatening everyone, <laughs> and found some guy asleep in the car outside and, and went, right, give me his parents' number. And so rang the father up and said, will you come and get your drunk son who's asleep in his car? This poor guy was obviously used to his son being drunk and going to sleep in the car and really didn't want to get up at like <laughs> half 12 <laughs> at night. To go and to yeah, I know. So, yeah, it was it was like that. I mean, God bless him because he's not around anymore. But in our village, because we lived in a little village mm. probably from up until when I was about, 11 or 12 in the village he was known as old man brand and i worked out how old he was at the time he was 37 when someone called him that <laughs> because he would because we had a war memorial 37. opposite our house it's nearly my age that's hilarious he was 37. i'm 35 so do that yeah well, we, there was a war memorial, and so like some kind of like biker types would go and hang around and make a load of noise, and he would go out and run at them and shout at them and wave a stick at them. You know, it was. But but even though he was tough and he, you know, he said that he maybe was abusive, but you loved him dearly, and and or or was it a complicated relationship? I think it was complicated. I did love him because he was my dad. And I yeah. kind of even sensed when I was young that he was suffering in some way. So I did give him a bit of leeway. You but know. how do you know he's suffering? Because you could see that it was just not quite right. Well, I could right. see he was very unhappy, really. Yeah. Yeah. And I think my mum took the brunt of it, quite honestly. You know, because... We, I was of, of that era where parents, where you don't really know what's going on with your parents and they never tell you anything. And so you just have to work everything out yourself. Mm. And you get a bit wrong sometimes, but yeah. Do you think that's why you then went into nursing because you wanted to help people because maybe you couldn't have helped your dad as much as you wanted to? Well, I think there's some there's some um, element of, of it that... that is true what you say um my mum also worked as a as a mental health social worker before she she then specialized in child protection after that but so for example she would take us to the local kind of very big um psychiatric hospital again in the middle of nowhere because they had a badminton court there so we would go and like play badminton there when we were kids and there were lots of people wandering around. And I just thought it was a fascinating place. You know, I was never scared of it. And unfortunately, I feel like for years, they've stopped doing it now. But the tabloids used to really demonise mm. poor mental health. So you would have a picture on the front of a tabloid of a, of a famous person who'd had some sort of breakdown. And they'd pick a particular photo that actually did make them look dangerous and a bit yeah. mad. Um, and I, I used to be really angry about that, you know, because I thought it was so unfair because then in the end, people would say, well, you know, if you're schizophrenic, then you must be like really violent and dangerous, which, Correct, which yeah. in many ways couldn't be further from the truth. It, it is interesting, though, because it's you're, you're right. I think it's um, firstly, whenever anyone historically had some sort of mental health disorder, 
oh, it's a breakdown. Oh, they're, they're going through a breakdown. It wasn't depression, anxiety, or insomnia, or whatever it could have been. It was just, oh, they're having a breakdown. Yeah, that's right. Oh, let's ignore it. They're having a breakdown. You know, whatever it was. And you're right with sort of psychiatric units is that, you know, you see it in horror movies. Horror movies are constantly set in these places, right? So you become yeah. fearful of them. And that's amazing. You used to go and play Babington there. And why we? Because as a child, that would seem a little bit scary. But why wasn't it scary? I think because... Uh, my mum was so relaxed about it. You know, it was one of these huge buildings that looked like it could be in a horror film. Mm. Sort of brooding, you know, and when the, when the light was fading, it was like that. But it just, it never bothered me, really. What makes someone funny, do you think? Well, I, I think it's impossible to explain in one sentence because there, to me, there's so many different types of funny I mean, there's there's funny, naturally funny people who could sort of say anything and it would be funny the way they say it. But there are also other very funny people who are very, very kind of specific about the sorts of things they say in their comedy. It depends. What sort of comedy do you like? I think I like storytelling. Yeah. I, I like observational comedy, but, you know, that... Well, that's very American, isn't it? Observational is it? comedy. Yeah, it is. You know, and they kind of go, hey, you know when you're on the auto, no, auto bomb, that's Sorry, wait, wait, but you, where you are know, we in the world? Oh, shut up. <laughs> you know, like, go on, hey, you know when you're walking down the sidewalk? I hate that sort of comedy. <laughs> but <laughs> so, so, but it, why? Because it's too simple. It's really important if you're doing that sort of comedy that you identify with what they're saying, you know. So, like, they'll go, hey, you know when you're at, I don't know, some big baseball pitch in America. Hey, when you, go, I know no, when you're at the Yankees. <laughs> I don't know what that's like. I think, on the whole, our humour is very different from theirs. I think theirs is kind of lighter, on the whole, apart from, obviously, some comics who are very dark, but... And our 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 culture, comedy wise, is self deprecation, mm. going as far as you can go without getting arrested, <laughs> um, you know, and and probably um, very different politics as well. So, I mean, I've, I, you know, like I've never been to America. You've never been. I've never been. Why no. not? Because I don't want to. You're not allowed in. Oh yeah, that's the good. drug charges, isn't it? That's it's what... not drugs. It's murder as well. <laughs> 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 You've never been? No. I've seen it from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> what? You looked at the border and had you, well, you got I, to sort of Seattle, whatever it was, just before Seattle. I went to the Montreal Comedy Festival uh -huh. and ridiculously, I went with a friend of mine and we drove, well, I drove from Montreal to the Niagara Falls, mm -hmm. which is a five hour drive. I hadn't quite realised that it was that far and of course you can see the American Falls from our side but she was endlessly entertaining because as we drove into the park where the Niagara Falls is yeah. do you know oh, there it is she's sort of like oh right she's great <laughs> and I went that's a fountain anyway <laughs> it was all like that over there she was a joy to take over but why have you not decided to go to America because you just you just don't really agree with it want to go there um because I think I never wanted to, you know, a lot of people do that thing, I want to make it in America. And I never felt that. Um, I think the only reason I would go is to kind of see things, um, you know, like incredible, like the Grand Canyon, maybe just as a cliched example. Mm -hmm. I never fancied Disneyland and I didn't want to soil the kids by <laughs> taking them there. Um, so... <laughs> Because it's just, it's just so what? Well, I don't know what commercialized. Yeah. I don't know, but so you you hate being sold to. You don't like. All I of don't that. like being sold to. No, your your, which is your, it makes you you're just very authentic. You're authentically you as well, which is well, authentic's a bit of a weird word, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, the way I can describe. Joanne. She's authentic. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't do ads, for example, and I never have done ever ever no and i find that weird about like social media the way that people are um just kind of covered Selling. in in little tags going you know supplied by or you know um clothes products 
M&S, Sainsbury's, whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm not having a go at other people for doing them. But I agree with you. Personally, I just don't want to do them myself. But why? But but explain that. What What is it the... What is it the sort of idea of selling that... that because I know it's selling feels like a it, it, in the nicest way, even though I I definitely have done it, is it feels a bit dirty for some reason. Well, let's go to George Orwell briefly, shall yeah. we? Great, Be- because he said that advertising is the rattling of a stick inside a swill bucket, and I know it's a bit extreme, but I kind of see what he means. You know, people people are kind of scrabbling to sell their product and. I think, uh, like at the worst end, maybe, um, you know, um, all these um, betting apps and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, I kind of feel for a lot of people they're damaging. And so to advertise them is a bit sort of morally questionable. Um, and at the other end, I just feel, I mean, I personally always wanted to do anti adverts. So I wanted to come on after an ad and go, can I swear? Yeah. That product shit. <laughs> I've tried it and I don't know why that person is saying it's all right. Um <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> I do that like for no money, you know. But are we all selling throughout our lives? Selling ourselves to our partners or our husbands selling comedy tickets? It's just a different sort of selling. Well, I see that as like a job, you know. And yeah. I think that's very different from I don't think of myself as a product. I mean, maybe I am, but I don't see myself but like that. you're definitely that. a brand. Oh. 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 No one's made that, that joke before. clever of me, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> what happened with the heroin addict boyfriend? Uh, what happened with him? Well, we were together a long time. How long is long? Probably... 30 years. <laughs> no, you're still married to him, <laughs> dear reader. <laughs> Um, what happened to him so you left home with him though I left well the weird thing this is what happened I'll tell you this was this give it to me play by play I want to actually so what so you bring back this guy dear chap your dad hits him then what happens well then we've got a few months of of them saying you can't see him and me kind of sneaking out to see him and all that sort of thing and then my dad getting increasingly angry and saying you know you've got to get rid of him and all the rest of it and and then saying to me uh, right this is you know here's an ultimatum if you don't stop seeing him we want you to leave home it was that basically Mm. in the end Um, and ironically I I found somewhere to live and I moved in but the same week that I did that I don't know if it was deliberate on his Part, but he just happened to get offered a very good job in London so he then moved to London and lived there during the week and he would come back and see me at weekends and after about six months I I always used to meet him at a pub in the old town in Hastings and I got there half an hour early to meet him walked in thought he's he, he's not going to be here for a bit but I walked in and he was he was in the corner snogging another woman. Well, not woman, like a 17, 18 year old. So, that, that in my head, I went, I've given up my entire life mm. for you. I, I, you know, and look, you've done this after only six months. That breaks your heart. It was awful. It's awful. Yeah. It's actually, I always, I. Re- <laughs> I remember when I had my first heartbreak and I obsessed. Was it that sort of scenario or was it? No, it it wasn't as bad as that. It actually wasn't bad. It was sort of, well, I loved, I loved, was in love with this girl, wanted to marry her. I must have been 16, 17, so probably similar age, right? Yeah. And she broke up with me in Oxford and I got down on my knees and begged her (laughs) not to do it. I can understand that. Honestly, I couldn't breathe. It's, it's hard. And, I think heartbreak is one of the most painful experiences to go through. It's horrendous. I agree. But I mean, there's, it makes for kind of great literature, doesn't it? Because mm. I think some of the best books in the world are about that madness that you experience when someone doesn't want you anymore. You can't quite believe it until it happens to you. It's, it's so And then you think you're in a dream. 
Yeah. You you want to go to bed and say, don't worry, I'll wake up tomorrow and I'll be okay. Yeah. But it's, that's hard. So what? How, so you have to deal with this heartbreak and then you have to go home? What happens? Well, what... what? No, I didn't go home. I stayed where I was living and... Um, Did you walk over to him and say, what the... I squirted him with a soda siphon. Oh, well, both of them. Because there was one on the bar and it seemed the nearest, less fatal weapon, to be honest. So, That'll teach him. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> and so then he came kind of crawling back and said, oh, I didn't I, I didn't, didn't like him. I don't know what I was doing. I had a lot of drinks on the train, la, 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 la. So I was so angry. So I pretended that everything was all right. And then over the next couple of months, I plotted. And oh, no. So he went... The gunpowder you know, plot. <laughs> no, yeah, not to kill him. <laughs> okay, fine. But, <laughs> Always going back to killing. Are we today? He went up to London back to work, not mm. straight away after a few weeks while I got my ducks in a row. He went up to London and um, he said, oh, I'll be back Friday. So whilst he was up in London that week, I moved and I moved everything out of our flat as well. Um, it was more mine than his, really. And so I wanted this image of him coming back on Friday night, putting his key in the door. And the whole place was empty and I'd gone. So I did that. That's amazing. I was delighted with myself. Yeah, I'm, d- I'm delighted with you and I'm not even there. That's amazing. It's funny how those situations where you you slowly by slowly can get the strength to do things. And you kind of relate to it, whether it's a job or it's a relationship. You kind of go back, but then slowly by slowly you plot your exit. And then when you do the exit in this sort of, way that you did it's kind of you get it's almost better revenge absolutely absolutely because obviously i never saw what his expression was when he arrived there but i just kind of could imagine it and interestingly it took him about a year and a half to find me because i told everybody else not to tell him where i'd gone all the people close friends you know so nobody did and Um, when he found you what happened well, when he found me, I was living in Tunbridge Wells because I was at school in Tunbridge Wells. So I had a lot of friends there. Mm. Um, so I moved there and I got a job in a pub full time. And what happened was that one night I was working in the pub and he just walked, he walked in. So What did you do? Well, it ended up with us getting back together again for a bit. I'm so oh, sorry. It, dra- it drags on for years. Oh. No, I thought it was going to be something where, ah, oh, what? And all my friends absolutely hated him. And he was, he was a bit of a, he was a bit of an idiot, really. But, you know, yeah, it does very it. charming and funny. So you then, you then move into, so you go and work as a nurse and you're specializing in sort of mental health. Yeah. And the the interesting thing about that is that the culture, as we said back there, was totally different to what it is now. Mm. You know, so when when people come in for diagnosis, whether they are depressed or anxious or they are going through a schizophrenic moment, whatever it is, it, it, how has that changed to when it was then to when it is now? Because now people come in and everyone's very empathetic, very, very and understanding. Whereas before. Oh, we were empathetic. You're were thinking you? too far back to one <laughs> flow of the cuckoo's nest. Yeah, were you in Shutter <laughs> Island? <laughs> 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 no, it, no, it wasn't like that. Really? Not at all. And um, it was, you know, I, I worked on a, a selection of different types of wards when I was training. So general psychiatry wards, adolescents. I worked on the locked ward. So I got a very good experience, but I ended up full time on the walk-in 24-hour emergency clinic which just was a fantastic service which shut down years ago Mm. at the hospital I was at where anyone literally could walk off the street who was worried about their mental health and see someone it was like A&E really um, for people with mental health problems but was it called mental health no it was called psychiatry yeah yeah it was called you know I was called a psychiatric nurse not a mental health nurse because uh, because if people but so people would be feeling because it, it's you know I, I, there's there's definitely something right now which is I remember as a kid right I remember when I I was sent to boarding school at eight years old and I remember um, well that must have been scarring in some ways oh God, in yeah. many ways was it <sighs> we we get into that one day Jesus it was it was scarring because what's my parents didn't tell me what was going on 
They just, my mum found it too difficult. My mum was going through a divorce with my dad at the time. I didn't know about it. I was also from the sort of era where people just never spoke about stuff or the parents never told the kids. So I didn't know what was going on. I was dropped off at this school. Did you know you were going to stay there? No. I, well, I, my mum is convinced that she told me. But I'm like, I don't... And so, and, and as, a, as kids, we remember. We, and I don't remember it at all. So I suddenly, at the end of the day, said, where's mum? And my shadow is the older boy who's looking after me. said, oh, no, your mum's gone home. And I was like, what? And I was given a school number. I, I was given That's a awful. It was, it was horrendous. But I think it was quite common, wasn't it? There's because there's some very famous letters. I'm not comparing you to Winston Churchill. You should. But I will. If I you get want it all the time. <laughs> yeah. His letters to his mother. Yeah. And I think the same thing or similar happened to him. But he sent letters to his mother, and when you see them, they're they're all smudged because he's actually crying while he's writing the letters. Yes, it's awful. It was awful. It was and awful. also, I remember Prince Charles. There's a very powerful, li- tiny little bit of film of him arriving back from his first term at school and being met at the station with a carpet and everything by the Queen. And he walks up towards her. He must have been six or seven. And she shakes his hand. <laughs> and you you just think, wow. That yeah. is so inappropriate, knowing what we know about separation and children Completely. and everything. And and I, you know, you know, in some cultures, kids s- sleep in the same room as you until you're six, seven, eight years old. You know, that happens like regularly, right? Yeah. And so to be sent away at eight was a lot. And yeah, it was it was scary, but also I kind of just sucked it up and, and I didn't show emotion. But I remember I used to lie in bed at night and I would get a lump in my throat. And I couldn't swallow. I was like, couldn't swallow. But I wouldn't tell anyone because I didn't know what it was. But if someone had told me that's anxiety, yeah, I would have then labelled it. And I would have gone, oh, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, okay. And then maybe that would have become a deeper issue, I don't know. Because the next morning, lump had gone, forgot about it, right? And do you think there's a bit of freedom? And maybe there's not, I'm just spitballing here. Freedom in the sense of when people used to walk in off the street and you would look after and it was not mental health, it was psychiatric unit or whatever it was. Yeah. Now there's this sort of, in a great way, we talk about a lot, but there's also an obsession over it, over anxiety and all these different things that it almost spreads a little bit as well. Do you feel like that can happen or no? What I f- feel is that actually different types of, let's call them mental illnesses, um, are they, they're, they're nuanced and they're kind of on a spectrum. And yeah. people don't seem to understand that some of the time. So you can get mild anxiety which is very appropriate when you're going for a job interview mm. or, or you know, um, you have an exam or something. Um, and that's very different from someone that's getting the most appalling, appallingly debilitating panic attacks. Mm. And it's, it is the same route, you know. And so people will sometimes say, oh, you know, I've got OCD. And they'll either mean they're up, they're so crippled that they can't go out, mm. or they'll mean I fold my sheets up in a certain way, and that's I think what the confusion is, you know. I agree. And no one knows what's what really the the whole spectrum is, and what are the different stages along it. And I think we're just all a bit confused, and we're confused about what to call things anymore. Is that acceptable to call something that, or is that not anymore you know I think it's complicated because I hear people talking on the radio saying oh I've got mental health and they mean actually they've got mental ill health but they don't quite understand how the terms are now meant to be used so I kind of find it really confusing it is confusing and I think you're so right because I remember when I went to uh, I had I, I was dealing with this anxiety boarding school blah, all that mm. different thing and I went to this therapist and I said I'm you know I'm the, I think I have bipolar I definitely I, you know all because I was my emotions were so up and down and the therapist said I'm going to take you to a place where actually you're going to see where people are are, are are not very well and then you'll see the difference with what you're having which is anxiety you've got anxiety but you have to understand the difference between two because if you catastrophize your own mental health that's going to be more of an issue because you're going to lean it to who that is was, that person uh, she's called mal she was called mal malaya khan and what was that was she a psychiatrist she was a psychiatrist uh, yeah how really what a great thing of her to do yeah i know because particularly like with bipolar 
you can also have a thing called a cyclothymic personality, which means you go through periods when you're down and other periods when you're like a little bit high and you're all positive. Yeah. But that's not an illness. It's just you and the way that you are. Whereas if you actually have bipolar disorder, that is like so much more serious. And complicated. Yeah, and there's actually a drug that really works for it that people sadly have to stay on and the side effects are kind of a bit difficult. Yeah, and a lot of people don't want to keep taking it. And so when they stop, you know, that's when they sort of, for want of a better word, they break down again. But you need to sort of delineate what the parameters are of how they're feeling and what their behaviour is. You know, if you see true sort of bipolar disorder, which, to be honest with you, we used to call it manic depressive psychosis Mm. because people did literally lose touch with reality sometimes when they were on a high. I mean, I can remember someone being brought into us by the police because that was a big part of our job who had literally gone into a multi-storey car park and jumped from roof to roof of all the cars in the car park and dented the whole lot of them. Well, you know, that's not that's not what most people think of as bipolar. Your behaviour is totally out of control, really. Do you... Um, is it de- de- deposition? 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 Does, do you shift towards the sunnier side or can you shift towards sometimes the darker side yourself myself yeah oh i like to go everywhere (laughs) yeah (laughs) because i definitely sit with my you know my uh, and and sometimes i think these things you you maybe get them from parents because you were just talking about your dad and i know with my mum i can see her now my mum definitely has anxiety undiagnosed she you know she but i can see it within i think i does she just try and suppress it yeah i think so a little bit. A lot of people self-medicate if they have anxiety, normally with alcohol, mm. because it allows them to freely sort of socialise without the, the horrible panic kind of rising. I did that in, in my twenties. Yeah, a I, lot of people do that. I did in my twenties because, and I, and but mine was just for lots of it, doing a show, not knowing the future, all that kind of stuff. And I used to drink through it, and I thought, oh, I'll be right, I'll just have a drink and it'll be fine. And then you realise that it adds on to another issue. Because then you suddenly become a bit codependent on alcohol. And that then becomes a real sort of tornado to deal with. I never shifted too much on that side, thank God. But I know people do, and that's quite hard. It's hard to... And how do we educate people on that? That's the tricky thing, right? It is tricky. I mean, there's also like a group of drugs called um, benzodiazepines, which are things like Valium and Librium and that sort of thing. And the problem with them is they're highly addictive. They do the job brilliantly in Mm. terms of your anxiety but if you go to a gp these days they probably won't give you any more than two weeks worth because they've been told by the general medical council or whoever it is you know that that the person will then be in danger of becoming addicted to them and then you have a whole other issue so it's very difficult because most of the drugs that they use and a lot of them are much better than they used to be Mm. they're not perfect so you'll either have side effects or you'll have dependency issues. And it's very difficult, you know. I mean, I think, again, the op- the opiate sort of drugs like heroin and that sort of thing, some people use them to, to, to medicate yourself, themselves. And like people say, like, with alcohol, um, oh, you know, don't give people on the streets any money because they'll only spend it on drink. And I think if I lived on the street, I'd quite like to be pissed all the time because it'd be better than being sober, wouldn't it? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so or a heroin addict. It's because, so true. You know. Yeah. And the issue is not really with the, the dependence to some extent. It's to do with you have to be able to afford to buy heroin, for example, you know. And, and so you start stealing and then you lose your house and then you lose your relationship and then you're right at the bottom of the pile. I'm not suggesting we give everyone money to buy heroin with, but, you know, the, att- the, the problems that are attendant upon sort of drug abuse are social ones largely. And yeah. I used to think when I worked at the Maudsley, it's in South East London, it's in quite a deprived area. And I, you know, I used to think, I'd I'd have mental health problems if I lived in some of the places around here. And if I couldn't work because I was disabled or 
you know, whatever reason it was. Mm. Social conditions are so wedded to depression, for example. Yeah, you completely know. is. I'd be depressed if I if I lived 15 floors up and, and the couple in the next door flat were fighting all the time. Yeah, of course you were, because your social environment is forcing you into that space. You Absolutely. Just, but the juxtaposition is so interesting because you're doing all of that and you're working in that space, but then you're doing comedy as well at the same time. I did them both for two years. That yeah. is wild. <laughs> so that is the because that's quite you, that's very heavy. One side you're doing, and I'm sure there, there's some interesting moments, but then you have this completely opposite side. And when I when I find your stage name to begin with, and I'm hope I'm getting this right. Please say I'm getting it right. Was Sea Monster. The Sea Monster, the if you don't mind. The Sea Monster. <laughs> so, and I, what I find amazing is, when is that first moment that you go, you know what, I'm going to give this a go? I think I probably wanted to do it for quite a long time mm -hmm. because I, I, I loved comedy when I was a kid, you know. And I think, I suppose I somehow in thought in one form or another, the world's a miserable place and if people can laugh for a bit, it makes it better, even if it's temporary. I suppose I thought that. So that's, in a way, another side to being a nurse, if you like, to make people laugh and feel better for a bit. Because you were doing that, weren't <laughs> you, all the time within being a nurse? You were trying to cheer people up. Yeah, in a in a, in a a therapeutic form, <laughs> okay. might I add. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I did sort of have laughs with people. Because another thing that people think, I think, because... You know, in the olden days, people with mental health problems were so dehumanised by the press or by, mm. you know, the way that people would talk about them. A lot of people would think, oh, I can't talk to them because either they'll pull out a machete and try and kill me or, or they'll be so weird that I won't be able to talk to them, you know. And obviously there's a proportion of people who are very ill and they've lost touch with reality. And yes, they're not that easy to talk to or identify with in any way. Mm. But, but that's what your nurse training is for. Um, and, 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 you know, with me, I just found, I, I, like I said, you know, you said I like people and I liked being in, in that job where we could try and, try and help. But it's interesting because you then, the comedy on the side, you're doing it. Because you were hit with a lot of criticism to begin with, you know. You oh, that's still going on. I <laughs> wouldn't worry about that. I've had that for nearly forty years. But you know, I had stories, or I say anything you like. Honestly, I can't. You know, I, I really there is nothing in. I know what because of the weird thing you about were sp you would spat at or throw drinks at or have had shout, drinks thrown at me, shouted yeah. names, calling you net cow and all these different I mean, much worse than that what, what is the worst thing that people shout you're on stage and one person that i heard one of your first gigs someone's just the whole time heckling you the whole way through calling you something that awful. was my first ever gig and someone started chanting and actually it was a comic who, who who did it and he he was pissed and he just started shouting fuck off you fat cow over and over again until i fucked off <laughs> That is because I just, where do you get that resilience? Because any normal individual going to give it a go for the first time would just go, do you know what? Fuck this. I'm not doing this. I don't, I don't, I don't care about this. You know, I don't want these, these drunk idiots to just to be calling me these names. I just can't. What, how, what is the resilience? I think there were several aspects. So one was me, yeah. you know, and my upbringing. And, I, you know, I'd had a lot of issues with my dad. So mm. I wasn't kind of out of touch with people sort of being horrible to me. Because my dad, not all the time, but had been horrible to me. And we'd had to all learn to live with that, us kids. So there was that. There was also working as a nurse... Um, and in, in the, the emergency clinic, pe it, people's emotions were very heightened. So they would be quite abusive and particularly towards me because I was in charge. So I was the one who was always wheeled out to say, I'm sorry, we're not going to admit you or I'm afraid we can't give you any Valium or I'm, I'm sorry, you're too drunk to be assessed. You'll have to leave. So I was like I was like the head of that cohort that headed towards them. So I was used to really getting some much better abuse than I got when I was a comic, to be honest with you. Really? Much more imaginative and much more cutting. <laughs> you know, what so, do you mean cutting? Like, well, so, like, for, for example, when someone just said, fuck off, you fat cow, it, it wasn't like, you know, 
I hadn't heard it before. Yeah. And I kind of heard it before better. You know, that would be accompanied by a side dish of how they were going to kill me or they were going to rape me or whatever it was. So no one's ever said that. Well, they've said quite bad things in an audience. But, you know, on the whole, there was never anything as bad as I got when I was a nurse. And I got hit when I was a nurse. No audience members ever hit me. Wow. I've had beer thrown at me, but, you know. That is insane, because that is... I mean, that is uh, that resilience is huge. Because normally, you, that's some, you just able to get through it and not worry about it too much and just say, well, these are just words. It doesn't really matter. I've but seen also, it before. But also, you understand that... The vast majority of those people that do that are ill. Yeah. You know, and so it, it it's not their fault. But they need help rather than... Yeah, but there's an excuse that, and I get that, you can you can sort of put that in the corner and say, right, they're ill. But when you're in the comedy circuit trying out and then people are saying it to you, you're just like, hang on a second, what's going on here? I, I For me, I would... Maybe I'm too sensitive at times. Well, I think ev- you're probably the normal one. I think ev- I think everyone is sensitive, really. And it's a question of how you deal with it. I mean, with me, like with the fat thing, my thing was that I would always go on and try and be funnier about my weight than they were. And it was very easy because they weren't very funny about it, the audience, because they always used to say the same thing. You know, it was that they didn't sit at home and write really witty heckles whereas i sat at home and tried to write heckle put downs so what was your best heckle you had i heckle put down or heckle i want to hear both if you go right. uh what was my best heckle well i i used to like the sweet heckles to be honest you know and i think if someone heckles and it's really funny you should just acknowledge that um, uh, because that they've said something really funny so if i so, was to shout at you i'd go oh, get off you fat cow well, if I had a particular fat one, that I and I would say something like, oh, I don't worry, I deliberately keep my weight up so a tosser like you won't fancy me. So that would get a bigger laugh than the original heckle. So you <laughs> kind of <laughs> yeah, use great. one, you know. And then the audience is on your side. That's right. And that's kind of, in a way, what you're, what you're looking for, really. Because as, as a comic, oh. as soon as you show a bit of vulnerability and start to falter a bit, audiences aren't particularly kind and they don't go, oh, you poor thing, we'll go easy on you. They get worse, you know. So really? you can't show any vulnerability at all. No, that's right. Wow, I thought it was the opposite. I thought as soon as you... Oh, God, no. They want to kill you. I thought if you showed vulnerability, they would feel sorry for you. No, they don't. They don't. (laughs) That is horrendous. So as much as... When you do comedy, also, you get to do uh, the corporate gigs. Have you ever had a strange one of those? Loads. They're all strange. They're all strange, yeah. And I think... One that I was like quite proud of was I did a, um, a corporate gig and it was all builders, right, um, in, in Southampton in a hotel. There's about 900 of them. And when you do those gigs, they don't know who's going to come on. So you're kind of a surprise. So I got announced on and I could just hit, there was basically an audible sigh of despair. <laughs> and I thought, God, how am I going to get around this? And I've just, and this actually came into my head at the time. And this is kind of like, quite unusual for me because I'm not a terribly spontaneous person and I said to them I can tell you're looking at me and you're thinking what on earth does she know about building and and I said well you'll you'll be absolutely surprised because my dad is a structural engineer my brother's a quantity surveyor and my husband's a fucking plank so <laughs> that that got like a massive laugh and then they they, <laughs> they were much you. warmer to me and that was the first thing i said so it really worked for me that day joe thank you so much we like to end the podcast uh with seven or eight questions it's eight questions <coughs> are you ready for them yes i am okay here we go what's a saying or phrase that always makes you smile or cheers you up well, I've always really liked, it's from a film called The Outlaw, Josie Wales, with Clint Eastwood in it. And the saying is, don't piss down my back and then tell me it's raining. Don't be the one responsible for someone, but then distant for something happening to, and then distance yourself from it. So, when have yeah. you needed that? Where, what situation have you thought? With the current government, possibly. <laughs> Great shout. What's the best compliment anyone's ever given you? 
I think t- to do with my comedy career, it was a woman probably in her early 80s coming up to me in central London and saying, I saw you many, many years ago and I remembered all your best put downs and I've used them so many times with people that have been rude to me or shouted at me and they've just been brilliant. So thank you. Love that. What scares you most about yourself? Uh, my parents. <laughs> no, shut up, Joe. I can't. I can't help myself. Looking in the looking in the mirror. Do you know what I? I don't know really. What did I say? I think. I think what you you're like you. I think oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, that. you you say it before your brain and get your your brain goes. Your mouth almost goes first, and then your brain goes. Mm, probably can't yeah, say that. I I do. I open my mouth sometimes before. before but, oh look, there's an ambulance coming to get me. Um. It's and, because of your uh, very big heart. <laughs> I've got myself into trouble a lot of times. Have you really? Know. Yes. Have you ever said something that you go, oh, God, I probably shouldn't have said Yeah, that. only about 100 times. Can yes. you remember one that was really bad, if anything springs to mind? Well, for example, you know, I've done jokes on TV shows which have then been seized upon. I had a joke about Margaret Thatcher mm. that went out on um, <coughs> Have I Got News For You. And it was it was about when she became Lady Thatcher. And I said, that sounds like something you'd sort your pubic hair out with before you go on holiday. And um, so Lady Thatcher. certain, <laughs> certain so... tabloids didn't really like that, that I was disrespectful. But I wasn't trying to be. I just thought it was funny. Do you feel like you have to censor yourself sometimes on that? <laughs> Only 24 hours a day, Jamie. Yeah, I do have to, really. And I don't always succeed. When was the last time you cried and why? Well, I can't absolutely remember the the last time, but I've I've lost a lot of relatives and friends over the last five years. And I suppose the thing that kind of really gets me and everyone has their different thing is, is like music. So if a song came on that my brother particularly loved or a piece of music that my mum loved, I think music more than anything kind of makes me you know, get a bit tearful, really. Are you scared of death at all? Well, I think you'd be a bit weird if you weren't. Some people are Well, like who? I don't know. Vickers. <laughs> Vickers aren't. Vickers aren't scared. <laughs> <laughs> Vickers definitely aren't scared. I think some people aren't. They're just like, oh, whatever. It's just a spinning rock. Now, I'm definitely scared of it. I just, I, I, for me, it's like, no, I don't really want to go. I think the thing is, it depends what stage of your life you're at, you know. Mm. I mean, I am a supporter of dignity in dying, and I and I do think that we could be a bit more sophisticated about how it's approached when you're suffering and you're in a lot of pain, mm. and it's not going to get any better. Um, and I can I can imagine that must be terrible for some people who last much longer than they want to, if mm. you know what I mean. So you're saying that if you were in a position, I should take you in your wheelchair. And then just push me push over beachy head. Just take the break off. Quite like you to do that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's something you can't let go of? Uh, it, what, like an object? It or? could be an object. It could be a feeling. It could be a uh, regret. It Let's could... just say pork pies. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Love a pork pie. <laughs> I've got one moulded into my hand at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> What is what's something that you'd be embarrassed for people to know you like or want? Well, I've thought about this for a long time because I think people are very kind of weird about what music you like. Mm. And like, if I like a song, I like a song. I don't care. I mean, obviously, if it was by a sort of a famous world fascist leader, I would be embarrassed. But I so, don't think any of them are singers, are they? Okay. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, and, and and I think people are quite sneery about uh, their, their, you know, about musical taste. So to be honest, like a lot of people, I like Dire Straits, I like Michael Bublé. I don't yeah. like everything they've done. I like certain songs of theirs. And, I, you know, I'm supposed to be embarrassed about that, apparently. I like that. And you like reality TV. I love reality TV. I love... Well, I love certain ones. I I really like Made in Chelsea. Know. You know that already. <laughs> no, it's so great. Um, what turns you off? I suppose it's bullying. 
is my big turn off. That's my one as well. I really <laughs> hate it. And I hate it when people um, take a bully people who are smaller than them in certain ways and they just take advantage of that. I really hate that. And I, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I think it's quite a hard thing for people to tackle because I think bullying cultures build up in certain organisations. And in a way, it's so all powerful mm. that although 80% of people would like to do something about it, they're kind of pushed down by the culture. Mm. So they're scared to speak up. And I've always thought that about whistleblowers. It's very interesting how we absolutely look down on whistleblowers and we think they're weird and there's something wrong with them. But the vast majority of whistleblowers are trying to unearth some sort of bullying or something that's unfair. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I worked in a in a, a residential place for um, adults with learning disability. This is in, oh God, 1975 or something. And it was very Victorian and mm. it was it was cruel. And um, and I went and complained to the head of the place and said I, I don't like that this certain charge nurse treated that person like that and did that and he just said to me well I suggest you leave then and did you? I did oh. I mean I I, I, try, I mean I tried to create a fuss but nobody there because Heard. of the culture yeah, you just was interested you... in listening because I was 17 or whatever I was yeah what turns you on? That's so difficult. God, dig deep. I haven't been turned on for about 15 <laughs> years by anything, if I'm honest with you. So nothing. Great answer. <laughs> what do you like most about yourself? Well, I suppose what I like is I like the fact that my best friends like me because they are wonderful people. And I kind of think, well, I can't be too bad if they like me. That's the nicest It's a bit answer. weird, isn't no, it? No, I like that a lot. Last one. What's your favourite swear word? Oh, Lord. I, I quite like fuckwit. <laughs> Why do you like that one? Because it just kind of sums up a certain sort of person who's possibly not really meaning mm. to be horrible, but they just have been and they need to think about their approach to life. I like shit. I think shit. Yeah, I think, I think I say shit's it. good too. Shit's great. Last question for you. Say that on Radio 1. I can't wait. I'm going on your to. first day. I go first word. <laughs> Shit, it's me, Jamie. <laughs> Fuck, did I say that? All right, yeah. hello, everyone. Oh, Bolly. <laughs> oh, Bolly. Yeah. Last question. When you watched Main Chelsea, did you like me on it or did you hate me? You know I liked you <laughs> on it. <laughs> Joe, thank you so much. Oh, we welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I loved it. Bye-bye. <laughs> 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 